Welcome to Electro Online. It never ceases to amaze me how difficult the problems can be on the JE Advanced Test, especially if you're not allowed a calculator. This is one of those problems. Seems pretty easy right up front, and in the end, you're going to pick the right answer because that's the one that's closest to what you think the right answer should be. But to actually show the right answer on your calculation without a calculator is virtually impossible. So we have to use a little bit of smarts on this one. This has to do with nuclear physics and particularly with radioactive decay. So we have a sample. It's radioactive and it's made up of radioactive potassium 4019. And uh, it decays into two stable nuclei. It can decay into calcium, 4020, or it can decay into argon, 4018. Now notice they give us the decay constant of each. For calcium, it's 4.5. Going from uh, potassium to calcium, it's 4.5 times 10 to the minus 10 per year. And for potassium to argon, it is um, 0.5 times 10 to the minus 10 per year. So they gave us the decay constant. The larger the decay constant, the faster it decays. So it much, the potassium decays into calcium much faster than it decays into argon. Now, given, in, given that in this small sample, the stable calcium and argon nuclei are produced by the calcium uh, potassium nuclei only, so all in the sample, the calcium, the argon that exist, only came from the decay of the potassium, from nowhere else. Now they tell us that in time t times 10 to the ninth years, so this is in billions of years, after so many billions of years, t being some number, the ratio of calcium to argon will be 99. So what is T equal to? How many billions of years will it be before the ratio between calcium and argon will be 99? Realizing that, of course, much more calcium will be uh, developed in that decay process because it has a much larger decay constant. They do tell us that the natural log of 10 is 2.3, and so we're looking for T. Now those are the possible answers, either 1 billion, 2 billion, 4.6 billion, or 9.2 billion years before this happens. So the first thing I would think about is this. Well, let's compare not the decay constant, but the half-life. And we know that the half-life, T1 half, is equal to uh, the natural log of 2 divided by the decay constant. So in the case of calcium, so going from potassium to calcium, so for calcium, the half-life, or when we, go, when we go from potassium to calcium, the half-life will be equal to natural log of 2, which is 0 0.693, divided by the uh, decay constant, so that would be 4.5 times 10 to the minus 10 per year. So, that will be in years. So, the way to do that is to write this as 6.93 times 10 to the minus 1. So, then when we calculate that, 4.5 goes into 6.93. Uh, let's see here, that's 45, that's about, I would say about 1.5, 1.5 times 10 to the 9 years. So, this is in years. All right, approximately. Without a calculator, you can kind of say, yeah, it's about 1.5. And then if we go from potassium to argon, the half-life is equal to 0 0.693 divided by 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 10. So 0 0.5 goes into 0 0.693, that's about 0 0.7, about 1.4 times 10 to the 10, so that would be about... 14 times 10 to the 9th years. Can you change the top, the top of those things? Yeah, this per year. I, I was running out of room here, but you're right. I should put it like that, so that way we don't get confused. Very good. Okay, so now we have the half-lives. Now, if we ignore the argon for a moment, if we assume that it only decays with the calcium, then imagine this, that after one half-life, half of it will be calcium. That's after one half-life. After two half-lives, it would be three-quarters would be calcium. 
So we have 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and notice you always take the remainder, half of the remainder, and you add it. So then after, I'll leave a little bit more room here, after three half-lives, 25 divided by 2 is 12 and a half. Add that, you get 0 0.875. So now we have this much calcium. And after four half-lives, take half of that, that would be 12 and a half divided by 2 is 6 and a quarter. That would be uh, 0 0.9375. That's almost 0.94. So now you have lots of calcium. After five half-lives, take half of that. So let's say we are about 94, half of that would be six. Add that would be about 0.97, approximately 0.97. Uh, and so after six half-lives, you would now be at about 0 0.985, roughly speaking. So without calculator, you can say that after six half-lives, if all it did was go from potassium to calcium, forget the argon for a moment, you'd have 98.5% potassium and only 1.5%, I mean, 98.5% calcium, I better write that down, 98.5% calcium and 1.5% uh, potassium. But that's considering nothing was decaying to argon, which is, of course, not the case. But notice we're looking for a ratio of 99 to 1. Oop, that should be a one. There. Okay. So during that process, how much argon would have developed out of this decay process? Well, notice that in the beginning you have a lot of potassium left. Of course, the amount of potassium left diminishes very, very quickly. So after two, three, four half-lives of the potassium to calcium decay, there's not a lot of potassium left to decay into argon because it's decaying much more slowly. So most of the decay from calcium to argon happens in the very beginning. But with a half-life of 14, point, 14 uh, times 9 billion, that would be 14 billion years of half-life, you can see that most of the decay would happen in the beginning and at the very end, almost none of it would decay into, into um, argon. So, during the first one and a half billion years, which is only 10% of the half-life, how much would that have turned, how much of that would have turned that into argon? Well, if you take half of that and take 10% of that, that will only be 0.5. But again, as it's decaying, less and less potassium is available to turn to argon. Well, you can say that there's not a lot left to decay. Now, the question is, how much of that will decay into argon? And that's the real hard part to try and figure that out. So, if this is potassium, 100% potassium, and after one half-life, let me go, go down a little bit further, after about one half-life, we're down to half 50% potassium, which happens after 1.5 billion years. During that period of time, only a very small amount of that has actually decayed into argon. How much? Well, 10% of half-life. Ten percent of ten percent of a half-life. Oh. That would be a very tiny amount, maybe 1% or less. So maybe less, I would say, less than 1% of what was there, potassium, went into argon. And then at that point, there's so much less to be decayed into argon. So I'd say at that point, it would be much, much less much, much less than 1%, and so forth. And then at that point, there's so little potassium left that almost none of it would go into argon. So I would say that 1% or 2%, roughly speaking, again, without a calculator, it's kind of hard to figure that out, but I would say about 1% or 2% of all the potassium has gone into argon, and almost 99% of it would have gone into calcium. And there we have kind of the 99 to 1 ratio. And that would happen after six half-lives. So we're looking at six half-lives. 
Do you spell it with F or V? Lives. I think it's with a V. Right, half-lives. Always looks funny to me. All right. And 6 times 1.5 times 10 to the 9th is 9 billion. And the only answer that's close to that is answer B. There's no way this could have happened after 4.6 because at that point you have not nearly enough uh, calcium in order to have a 99 to 1 ratio to argon. So I'd say the next possible answer would be B. I would say B without a calculator. That's the best I could come up with. Again, it's a little hokey because without calculators, it's very difficult to figure out how much of that will decay in that process. And since the half-life of going from calcium to argon is so small, or I mean so large, the decay is, is so small and the half-life is so large, 14 billion years, by the time you get to half of that, but there's so little of it left that it virtually stops decaying into the argon number-wise versus into calcium. So I'd say that's probably the, the best answer I can come up with. And I would not be all that comfortable if I was taking the test to choose that answer, but I'd say that seems to be the best answer, and so I'll go with that one. Does that have anything to do with, if you look at 1.5 and 14, if you look at that ratio, would that be anything to look at? No, because really you have, to, you have to kind of go this way. First, let's assume you're just de decaying into calcium only and there's no argon to be decayed into. And then you can say, well, that would be the amount. So after six half-lives, about 98, 99% of everything you started with has turned into calcium. But they say, well, wait a minute, not so fast, because as it's doing that, there's a very small portion of that each time. There's always a very small portion of that calcium, very small portion, that actually develops into argon. Well, how much is that? Well, one half-life of calcium is 10% of a half-life of argon. So how much do you decay in 10% of a half-life? Well, it's a very, very tiny amount. And as it's decaying, since so much of that is already turned into calcium, then there's so little of it left to turn to argon. So the decay to argon is virtually zero at this point. All of, almost all of the decay into argon happens in the first few half-lives of, uh, of going to calcium. And so you could say it's probably about 1-2% max. And you can see without a calculator that's not easy to do.